Beneath its surface, the Mediterranean hides many a casualty of time. Rotting ships, temples shattered by earthquake, bones of hapless seamen caught in the Meltemi far from port. Today, the waves often conceal the slow poisoning of another victim, the sea itself. A year after World War II, Jacques Cousteau and other officers of the French Navy prepare to test early experimental models of the Aqualung in the waters of Veyron near Marseille. Amid a school of damselfish, the divers enter a watery universe filled with constellations of life. Here, the tuna-like lichia. There, a ray drifts along the bottom. The meru, or rock bass, timid yet perpetually curious. In only three decades, the sea floor has become a desert, bleak as the surface of some barren planet. Here and there, a few sponges and gorgonians tenaciously cling to the bottom. But the rich abundance has vanished. Ghostly and dim, the corridors of the grottoes once crowded with life are silent and empty now. Everywhere stretch the harsh underwater fields of decay. Marseille, fisherman Maurice Godin arrives to perform a duty. In an office near the harbor, Monsieur Godin dons judicial robes, now becomes chairman of a fishing tribunal, first established in the 15th century and elected by the fishermen to settle all disputes among themselves. Monsieur Of the court, Cousteau asks present fishing conditions in the Mediterranean. The reply is simple. Year by year, the fishing becomes worse and worse. From other ports come bitter echoes. In 10 years, there won't be any fish. 10 years, no fish. In 10 years, the marine life will be finished. Again, Calypso is outward bound. Across the sea, the ancients named the center of the earth, the Mediterranean. With the Black Sea, it forms a vast landlocked basin, 2,500 miles long and often two miles deep. There is only one portal, the Strait of Gibraltar, the Pillars of Hercules. Through this narrow strait, barely 15 miles wide, the earliest voyagers ventured into the Atlantic. Through it passes the only interchange of water between the Mediterranean and the ocean beyond. 
behind its gateway, the Mediterranean is being progressively suffocated by the industrial and urban wastes of its bordering nations and the transient traffic that travels across it. On the foredeck of Calypso, crewmen at last complete the large sailcloth contrivance, much like a parachute, for an experiment Cousteau has prepared. As the propellers are stopped, the crew hoists a signal, warning all ships that Calypso is halted and cannot maneuver. Now, while Calypso is held steady in the incoming current, the trial begins. Carefully weighted, its cloth cup braced by spars against collapse, the parachute is suspended from the hoist at the stern. Then, attended by small boats to prevent a fouling of the lines, it is slowly lowered into the sea. Making sure that the parachute clears the hull and its cable is properly attached to the traveling buoy, the diver returns to Calypso's deck to wait. As the parachute descends, Cousteau tells Chief Diver Falco they are repeating a process discovered and used in ancient times. At the surface of the Strait of Gibraltar, says Cousteau, the Atlantic Ocean flows into the Mediterranean by a three-knot current. But in the depths moves a contrary current, emptying the Mediterranean waters into the Atlantic. Even the Phoenicians, among the earliest and most venturesome seamen, knew of it. When winds failed them and they had difficulty emerging from the strait into the western sea, they lowered their sails into the depths and thus were pulled outward by the counter current. Now at a depth of nearly 800 feet, the submerged parachute catches the outbound flow. Like a great sail, not in air but in water, it pulls them westward to the Atlantic at a speed of two knots. The current is there, emptying the inland sea of some of its accumulating pollutants. But at the recycling rate of once in 90 years, nature is hopelessly tardy. The Mediterranean cannot cleanse itself of its wastes at such a rate. Led eastward by a joyous escort of Gibraltar's famed dolphins, the Calypso team follows to the island of Albaron on the Mediterranean side of the strait, midway between the Spanish mainland and Morocco on the North African coast. A tiny shard of land still garrisoned by Spain, Albaron today seems hardly warlike. Instead, it has become a natural refuge. Swept by the incoming currents from the Atlantic, it has preserved a kind of immunity from the pollutants infecting the Mediterranean. As Cousteau returns from his reconnaissance and the helicopter descends to its landing platform on the stern of Calypso, the divers prepare a descent through another element. Clumsy and encumbered in the ordinary topside world, their artificial aids permit them to explore an alien environment in which man cannot exist, but without which he cannot live. Again, the divers cross the threshold between one element and another. He 
here, far below the surface, amid the dim cathedral aisles of waving laminarians, amid the jungle growth of an aquatic Eden, the diver's lights reveal the secretive dwellers of a world that still seems new. Sheltered from contamination by the clean, moving water around them, they are hardly aware of the threats of that other world of men, only 150 feet away. Here, the floating rude screen of kelp celebrates not a creed, but the mute persistence of life. Later, in the wardroom of Calypso, Cousteau discusses the wider problems of the Mediterranean with divers Bernard Delamont and Raymond Call. Because the Mediterranean is almost totally enclosed by land, says Cousteau, it is especially vulnerable to the immense burden of urban and industrial waste that flows into it from nations with a population of 300 million people. With a map overlay, he indicates the areas from the Urals to Lake Victoria in Uganda. Sudan, Egypt, Algeria, Tunisia, Spain, France, Italy, Yugoslavia, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, Turkey, the Soviet Union, the nations of the Middle East. Many of these countries are heavily industrialized. The Mediterranean, he says, serves as a model for other bodies of water also burdened with wastes. Hence the urgency of Calypso's present mission. From the heights overlooking Marseille, Notre Dame de la Garde has always been the special protector of fishermen. But today, as angry buyers in the market complain, it is the fish that need it most. What is it with these fish, asks the woman. As far as I'm concerned, they should all be confiscated. Yet there are some who are less disturbed. 
regularly test their fishing luck at the sewer outfall. On warm weekends and holidays, the beaches are crowded with bathers and playing children. They seem untroubled by the casual warning painted on the seawall, beach polluted. Elsewhere, some even swim in the chemical exhaust of a large industrial complex. Why, Cousteau asks the mayor of Marseille, aren't the people told the full truth about pollution and its consequences? Because of morale, the mayor replies, and mentions an analogy in medicine. In France and elsewhere, the truth often is hidden from the terminally ill. It is a mistake, says the mayor, because only those who fight have a chance to get well. Everyone, he thinks, should be told the facts about pollution so they can join in the fight to save their beloved Mediterranean. In ports around the Great Basin, where fishermen come back with their scanty catch, the complaints are repeated in a dozen languages. Romania, not very many fish this year. Tunisia, just look at the beach, look what they've done to it. Italy, plastics, ice cream wrappers, garbage bags, we don't understand it. On vient d'apprendre récemment que dans la zone, par exemple de Sardaigne, dans la région de Cagliari, director of the pollution laboratory of Nice, Dr. Maurice Aubert, tells Cousteau of the increasing incidence of mercury poisoning, similar to that which occurred in Minamata, Japan. Because fishermen generally eat more seafood than do most people, they are particularly vulnerable. In Sardinia, recently, an investigation revealed that nearly a dozen members of a single family showed symptoms of Minamata disease. See Naples and die is the often repeated tribute to the panoramic beauty of a city, long celebrated in sentimental songs and honeymooners snapshot. But a closer look can be discouraging. In the waters of the busy port float debris and pollution of every kind. In it, too, suspended from rafts of floating drums, hang the panels of the commercial muscle beds. On them, Italian health authorities blamed the frightening cholera outbreak of 1973. Beginning in Naples, incidents of cholera, with its swift and often fatal dehydration, soon spread as far north as Milan and east to the Adriatic coast. While police cleared polluted shellfish beds and medical agencies fought to avert a major epidemic, more than 20 persons died of the disease. Abruptly aware of the penalties of pollution, masses of Italian citizens eagerly crowded the medical centers for vaccination against the threatening bacteria. Yet their fear had a short memory. Today, the basic threats have not diminished, but increased. 
Aboard Calypso, Cousteau and Falco study satellite photographs of the continuing pollution. Montre bien que les rivières apportent tout le long de la côte. In the light colored masses fanning out from the deltas, says Cousteau, the photographs reveal how rivers carry sediment and pollution to the coast. The Po River of Italy's industrial north shows a similar pattern as it reaches the Adriatic. In another picture, the Danube and its tributaries empty great swirls of pollution into the Black Sea. Collect toutes les pollutions et les déchets industriels et urbains de plusieurs pays. Collecting industrial and urban waste and emptying it into the sea, the rivers function as the kidneys of the continents. Much nearer to Earth, Cousteau flies over the Danube Delta in Romania, where the southern branch of the river enters the Black Sea. Though it has flowed through some of the most heavily industrialized areas on Earth, the river and its marshlands appear deceptively idyllic, the natural site for a wildlife sanctuary. Here, remote from the satellites circling above them, Romanian fishermen still practice the age-old ways, a moving frieze of patient men pulling their nets from the sea But the catch is no longer the same. Gone are most of the larger, heavier fish. Even the sardines and anchovies are becoming fewer year by year. Standing off the Romanian coast in the Black Sea, the Calypso again prepares to test the local waters as part of a wider survey. Here, a sampler tube is lowered to a standard depth of four meters, carefully, to avoid any contamination from the Calypso herself. A messenger slide then closes the sampler, which is then returned to the surface. There, its contents are carefully stored in contamination-proof plastic containers to be sent to the laboratory. For five months, Calypso ranges throughout the Mediterranean, taking not only water samples, but many other specimens, such as the bottom sedimentation here gathered by one of the divers. Commissioned by international committees as well as several individual Mediterranean countries, the Calypso team conducts a broad variety of research programs for later study and analysis. From the samples, such as the mud dredged up from the bottom, biologists are able to study the changing nature of whatever life or absence of life may be found in them. In many critical areas, the condition and abundance of submerged plant and animal life is recorded in a continuing inventory. Finely meshed nets are used to bring in plankton, the minute organisms which absorb and concentrate toxic products and form the lowest link in an ascending food chain from smaller to larger sea creatures and finally to man himself stored for subsequent laboratory examination. The samples are protected from decay by a chemical additive. The so-called Troika, or mobile underwater camera sled, is lowered to record continuous strips of photographic evidence of conditions on the sea floor. But much of the Mediterranean's pollution is as clearly visible as the track left by Calypso through an offshore layer of scum. The sources are many. 
the scores of thousands of industrial plants and complexes concentrated on the sea's northern shore, most heavily in Spain, France, Italy, and Greece. The urban centers, sometimes far inland, the annual influx of hordes of visiting tourists, the freighters and oil tankers that use the sea as a pathway. Into the air and the water, even through pipes carrying chemical exhaust along the bottom, these and other sources discharge a staggering burden of poison and debris. By one estimate, a thousand million tons of industrial and untreated household wastes each year. Even to sample these outlets, the diver must wear a dry suit, sealing him from any possible contact with the poisoned water. Long ago, it is said, Prometheus brought man fire stolen from the gods. It was a dangerous gift. Today, the great plume of flame above the petrochemical complex at Fort sur mer in southern France is not only a promise of man's liberation, it is also a warning of its possible cost. Again, aboard Calypso, the divers prepare Gloved and sealed in their protective suits, they enter the murky depths to learn what sort of life has survived there. They find an aquatic wasteland, a scarred desert stretching out from the denser pollution near the shoreline. Here and there lie patches of withered Posidonias. Once they provided spawning grounds and shelter for multitudes of fish. Today, like the occasional crab or other vagrant intruder, they simply fight to survive under the silt that lies like a suffocating hand over everything. Perhaps in time, a few pollution-resistant species of plants or animals may keep a foothold here. But in the disappearance of the old multiplicity of species, life will have shrunken. Nature will have lost many of the options by which life finds new forms and endures. In these clouded waters, this vista of decay and death, there remains only a litany of absent life, of creatures gone from this place, and whose numbers are declining, often with alarming swiftness, elsewhere in the Mediterranean. The great fish of open water, the marlin, the swordfish, the bluefin tuna. The coastal rockfish, groupers large and small, corvina, mullet, bream, lichia. The Mediterranean's only indigenous mammal, the monk seal. Red coral, sponges, gorgonian, Posidonia prairies. In more and more places there remains only emptiness. Like visitors returning from some grim netherworld, the divers must be hosed down and cleansed of contaminants before they rejoin the world above.
While desert spread along the bottom, a new presence paints fields of flowers on the sea. The burning gas wastes of the offshore floating oil rigs now appearing in the Mediterranean. denied their natural habitat, fish sometimes find shelter under the triangular floating platform, innocent of the threatening film of oil which impedes the life-giving exchange between the atmospheric gases and the sea. There have been no dramatic spills, but much of the film has been caused by tankers which flush an estimated half million tons of oily residue into the Mediterranean each year. From the nuclear power plants, such as the one at Bandeos, Spain, comes a different threat. Traces of radioactivity and a rise in water temperature from their cooling system's outfall. Dr. Antonio Ballester of the Institute of Fishing Research in Barcelona finds that on this day, the water temperature in the bay has risen to 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Yet, as he explains to Albert Falco, when the plant shuts down for repairs or other reasons, the water quickly cools. The physiological consequences for marine life, he says, are obvious. The successive fluctuations make the water untenable, either for cold water fish or semi-tropical species. The color and appearance of the water, says Dr. Ballester, reveal another threat in the pollutants discharged by the plant. Detergents and such toxic chemicals as sulfur or the chloride used to prevent mussels and other shellfish from clogging the pipes. Despite frequent misgivings, hopeful that the problems can be solved, other Mediterranean countries also plan nuclear power plants. But the fishing fleet at anchor in the nearby village brings in a declining catch and the men who draw their livelihood from the sea take a less optimistic view of the benefits of nuclear power. Some of the fishermen voice their anxieties to Calypso's Raymond Cole. One man reports that the area formerly called El Torn, surrounding the nuclear plant, was once one of their best fishing grounds. They used to go there for large sardines, but there are no large sardines there now. All they can catch are the tiny finger-length fish which decompose three hours after they're caught. Various other species, such as corvina and skate, have completely disappeared. The water around the plant has been analyzed, says a second fisherman, but since the results must be negative for the plant, they haven't been published. Another man says that one doesn't know how long the radioactive wastes remain active in the water. It is, he says, a hell of a world we are leaving our children. In the enclosed sea itself, there's little rise and fall. But from the land comes another tide the surging human influx that has built a seemingly endless wall of clamorous rookeries wherever there is a stretch of sand. Few of the structures have adequate sewage treatment facilities, often empty untreated wastes directly into the sea among the public that bathes in it. 
Up on the beach stretches a panorama of sunburned flesh, part of the 100 million tourists who descend on the Mediterranean each year. And around the sea, already overused and overburdened, the building goes on. Extensions of the coastal cities and holiday resort complexes, thousands of marinas form sheltered anchorages along the Mediterranean's perimeter. In them are crowded hundreds of thousands of pleasure craft, perhaps an even greater source of oil and other pollution than the great tankers themselves. Fragile as a dream upon the waters, Venice was sinking into its lagoon until authorities began to restore the subterranean water table by pumping. Now, like an aging version of Botticelli's Venus, she is again rising from the sea. But long protected against armed attack by the waters into which she dumped her wastes, pollution now threatens to corrode the very stones on which she stands. Ecologist Dr. Renato Rismondo describes the problem to Calypso's William McDonald. Every house discharges uh, the waters, the sewage waters, uh, directly in the canals. And this uh, uh, causes the growth of algae. Uh, you may see the growth of algae in the water line of the Palestine this canal. And all the place of the lagoon, and this uh, is the indication of the degree of pollution. But it is not only household waste that imperils Venice and its elegant structures. As Dr. Valentino Fossato tells Cristo, industry also plays a major role. Est-ce qu'il y a dans la lagune des régions qui sont particulièrement menacées? Si. Like a city under siege, ancient Venice is ringed by forces of the present. Around the mainland perimeter of its great lagoon are clustered industrial plants and complexes. And it is near these sites, says Dr. Fossato, that the heaviest concentrations of pollution are found, particularly hydrocarbons. Venice has survived a long and often violent past. Today, as chemical contaminants are flushed into its basin, the question is, can it survive the present? Yet far to the south, across the Mediterranean, there is clear evidence that man can make full use of his marine resources without depleting or destroying them. At Tunisia's El Biban Lake, even the cats have enough. Joined to the Mediterranean, El Biban still provides ample replenishment of its fishing stocks after uncounted centuries of harvesting the waters by the permanently fixed post nets set across the lake. Passing through the narrow entry in the Zodiac, the Calypso divers find a world still little stained by modern industrialized society. Never overfished, uncontaminated and cleansed by an underwater current whose power astonishes the divers, El Beban's clear waters are alive with a teeming piscatorial population. Around the divers swim curious schools of fish, declining elsewhere in the Mediterranean. Even the Corvina Negra, now rare in other parts of the sea, are plentiful here. But now the Calypso team follows the path of migrating flamingos to the lake of Tunis. 
There, circled by the great birds, the ruins of an old island fortress are paralleled by the ruin of the lake itself. A traditional food source for Tunis, whose industry now poisons it, the lake is blotched with algae, which progressively suffocates the marine life. The bottom itself is covered with a spreading infestation of weedy growth, which does not promote life, but retards it. So heavy is the growth in the fields of algae that either by engine or by oars, the zodiac has difficulty in passing through it. And yet, for all its rank growth, the cancerous algae brings no hidden benefit for man. Tunisian biologist M. Belkir explains. These algae contain a very elevated oligo-elements, to know that they can contain up to 012 ppm of mercury. These algae, says Mr. Belkir, contain prohibitive concentrations both of mercury and of lead. As a result, the plant is far too dangerous for animal consumption and cannot be used even as fertilizer. Around the lake, work squads struggle to keep the algae under some semblance of control. Yet it is an endless task, and perhaps ultimately a losing one. To cleanse the lake and restore it may well require more radical measures to eradicate the pollutant discharge which perpetuates the curse. Aboard Calypso, the sampling program goes on. Again, observed by Cousteau, a small grab is lowered to bring up specimens of sediment from the bottom. packages of foil, the sediment, like the water containers and other samples, will be sent on for laboratory study. But after five months sailing the length and breadth of the Mediterranean basin, after taking thousands of samples, interviewing hundreds of fishermen, scientists, public officials, doctors, and businessmen, the Calypso team's mission is drawing to an end. With most of the field work completed, I returned to Monaco's Oceanographic Museum and Laboratories to learn the answers the samples may provide. Founded in 1910 by Albert I of Monaco, the museum ever since has served as a center for multinational study of the oceans and is now associated with the International Marine Radioactivity Lab. Here now I can follow the progress of the scientists as they subject the samples to analytic tests. Through complex procedures, the contents of heavy metals such as mercury, copper, or cadmium, of pesticides and PCBs are measured with precision in the numerous samples of seawater and of sediments gathered from various depths. For each location at which the samples were collected, 
they can judge how widely and heavily the pollution has spread. Yet, when the accumulated evidence of all the instruments is calibrated, pollution alone, however serious, does not account for the degree of damage being inflicted upon the undersea environment. Clearly, mechanical aggressions, generally underestimated, must be equally deadly factors in the deterioration of the Mediterranean. Among them, the impact of the bulldozer. It is a usual concept that the sea erodes the land. Yet today, particularly in increasingly congested areas, it is the land that is invading the sea. Throughout the Mediterranean, roadways, airports, industrial sites, housing developments, marinas and port facilities encroach upon the sea at its most vulnerable point, the shallow and narrow coastal areas, which since time immemorial have served as the natural habitat and spawning grounds for undersea life. Like an underwater dust storm, the silt from the advancing shoreline coats every living thing in a smothering cloud, an impartial catastrophe which makes no distinction among the species. Manipulating the natural landscape to his needs, as in the case of Francis Durand's river, diverted to cool a power plant, man often discovers that nature's engineering was far superior to his own. Today, a varying flow of fresh water into a saltwater lagoon has so altered the salinity that no fish can survive. In conversation with Cousteau, Mayor de Fer agrees that the canal has had ill effects. Now, he says, the water in the lagoon is a halfway environment, neither fresh nor salty. But sometimes the transgressors against the sea are fishermen themselves. Describing some of the activities which threaten his livelihood, one Naples fisherman puts much of the blame on the continuing and widespread illegal practice of dynamite fishing, which kills or stuns marine life in a wide radius. He also criticizes some sportsmen's practices, fishing not for need, but for the honor of killing the biggest fish, as in this spear fishing tournament off the Italian coast. Beneath the surface, many of the larger fish do not recognize the divers as enemies. Thus, their natural curiosity is far more liable to bring them within lethal range of the diver's spear guns. Now, as the tournament contestants bring up their largest kills for trophies, they also are bringing up the very fish most useful for spawning and reproduction of their species. Like a white shadow on the bottom, another threat appears, the shallow water trawl net. Already illegal in some of the Mediterranean countries, it moves across the contours of the sea floor, scraping away the submerged prairies of Posidonia and other natural growth which provide spawning grounds for the fish.
In North Africa, one former trawlerman says the nets will doom all her life in the sea. Working continuously, nets are sent down for the smallest fish, which often are thrown away. Legal in some countries, illegal in others, so-called lamp fishing is widely practiced, using lights to attract the fish near the boat where they are easily netted. The fishermen sometimes bring in a bonanza. decline in numbers of the larger fish. Most of the catch is composed of smaller varieties for which there is a limited market. To the delight of whirling clouds of eager seabirds, great quantities of the smaller fish are simply dumped back into the sea. But among fishermen, there is a prevailing bitterness. Though they see best the causes closest to them, they all know that something is profoundly wrong. Il sud ha bisogno di una ristrutturazione di fabbriche per questi pescatori. Perché vengono mattine che questi pesci vengono buttati a mare di nuovo un'altra volta. È una miseria, perciò è inutile discorso, il discorso è troppo lungo. Il problema non è risolto, ma il problema è risolto. Sì, è risolto molto, molto, molto rapido. While plain men stare at the sea in anger and dismay, committees such as this one take a less urgent tone. The interests of science and industry are not incompatible, they say. The problems are not resolved, but are being resolved. Often the old banalities are repeated. Poised between yes and no, men speak the smooth language of evasion, practice the politics of postponement. Here in Venice, it's the most striking example of such a, the necessity of such a collaboration between the administrative parts, the scientific community, the industrial community, the fishing community, the urban community. Everybody must cooperate. In Marseille, the members of the Fishermen's Tribunal cannot evade the problems of the ailing sea. Asked by Cousteau whether they would urge their children to become fishermen, they answer with a quick and fervent, no, never. Yet, as a sad footnote, Chairman Godin reminds them that this has been their manner of livelihood since early times. For the sake of themselves and of all men, he hopes that one day their children too may become fishermen. Briefly, the anxious and contending voices fade. Again, Cousteau enters the soucoupe, prepares a descent into a part of the sea still unspoiled. Once more, I drift downward through the blue spaces of the sea. Out of the depth, there rises toward me a garden of sea fans, the sculptured branches of gorgonias. Since ancient times, troubled men have sought renewal in desert and wilderness. Today, in these solitudes of the sea, man must create sanctuaries against himself. Once they called the Mediterranean Mare Nostrum, our sea. Around it, men built the temples and marketplaces of our past, shaped the inner world of our beliefs. Here, painfully, century by century, 
warring nations began to learn that our sea lay in the common custody of all. Today, we are beginning to learn that our sea means even more, that we protect life not out of arrogant charity or sentimental compassion. In full truth, we are partners to the fish, the crab, the snail, the grasses that grow in secret places beyond our sight. Upon their lives, our lives depend. Upon their survival, hangs our own.